My name is Don Vians. I'm um, a professor in plant breeding and genetics in the School of Integrative Plant Sciences here at Cornell. And uh, we've put together a program for our first hemp field day um, ever, where um, fortunately we have some nice looking hemp for you to be able to see. And I noticed everybody was kind of roaming around looking at it, and you'll have opportunity to do that a li little bit later on as well. But uh, we have a lineup of some of us here from Cornell who are working with hemp, and we have quite a few people, and the number of people are growing, who are interested in working on different aspects of hemp in terms of research and extension. And, um, and we also have uh, Chris Logue, who I'm not sure he's here yet, but oh, there he is, wonderful. Uh, he's from the Department of Agriculture and Markets, who is going to be uh, talking a little bit later on about the uh, potential uses, the marketing of hemp, and also some of the regulatory issues that, uh, that growers need to keep in mind. I noticed that uh, looking at the list of all of you who have uh, signed up or enrolled online for um, this field day, uh, that there's a wide variety of uh, backgrounds that you come from and interests that you have about hemp. So what I would like to do is to keep this informal. Um, certainly there are uh, half a dozen or so of us who are going to be giving talks, but to keep it informal such that as you have questions or even comments or want to get into discussion about anything, just barge in at any time to do that, okay? So, uh, so it would be more fun if this was more of a two-way discussion or a multiple-way discussion than if it's just us up here uh, lecturing to you. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, we also have um, Assemblywoman Donna Lopardo, who is somewhere close by, but I don't think she's here. There she is. Oh, wonderful. So she, she's just waving her hand there. I wanted to recognize her because she is the one who initiated all of the discussions about industrial hemp and the potential uses here in New York State and, um, and as the subsequent legislation and, and um, essentially paved the way for us to be able to, I mean, without her, we wouldn't be having this field day right now, essentially. So let's give her a round of applause for what she's done. And, and certainly any time that you want to contribute to the discussion, feel free to jump right on in. So, so again, we'll keep this very informal. Um, so what I'd like to do is to start out by just telling you how we got into this research here at Cornell University in the first place. And, uh, and it started last year with the Department of Agriculture and Markets who made some funding available to us to, to start out by evaluating varieties of industrial hemp that come from Canada and Europe um, by and large and to see which ones will perform the best under our conditions in New York State until we have time to actually do some breeding specifically for New York State conditions. So that's what this set of trials is all about here. Um, there are a couple of people who will explain more about this um, in a little while from now, so I won't try to steal their thunder. But, um, but by the time we went through all the, the regulatory approval process that had to be done in tandem, we couldn't do it all at the same time. Uh, it wasn't until late August of last year that we were able to actually uh, purchase some seed. And obviously that's too late to get some good experiments going. But, uh, but my research crew uh, planted out some small trials only about a mile in that direction from here um, at the 1st of September last year, not to really get good data on, on harvest. I mean, by the time that froze um, sometime in November, it was only about six or eight inches tall. But it, at least it gave us a chance to, um, to see how well we could establish some experiments. They actually tried out two different planters and got some good data. So we have a little experience behind us before um, doing the real trials this summer. And you can see behind me that, that it was very successful in establishing a good trial there. Um, so that's what last year was all about. Um, but what I'd like to do is to um, turn this over to Dr. Chris Smart to describe uh, more of what the uh, research plans are for us here at Cornell, and uh, not only what we're doing now, but what we plan to do in the future, and, um, and, and what's happening in terms of, of, of production around the state in regards to research. Chris is a uh, professor in the um, section of plant pathology and plant microbiology in the School of Integrated Plant Science, um, and she's the one who's coordinating all that we're doing here with industrial hemp in our college. Uh, and on top of that, she's, uh, she's also a director. I know you're interim director, but essentially you're a director. Today, I'm director. Oh, are you? Today is the day. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so she is, 
She is the director of the School of Integrative Plant Science. So Chris. Well, thank you, Don, and, and welcome everyone to Cornell. Uh, it is a beautiful day, and this is uh, a really remarkable hemp trial. Don and his, his crew have done a great job. Um, in terms of the research that we're doing here, we now at Cornell, well, let me give you a bit of a history. Um, last year, in 2016, there were 15 or 16 states across the U.S. that had industrial hemp research projects. This year, and, and Don's group was one of them. Uh, we're, it was really fantastic that he was. This year, there's 31 states. So industrial hemp is booming, and, and we have a lot of folks to collaborate with across the country. Um, so it's really nice that um, the state has enabled us to jump in and, and really um, get on the wave of industrial hemp that's happening right now. In terms of what we're doing, um, we now have 11 scientists at Cornell that uh, they and folks in their labs have projects on industrial hemp. Last year, this time, we had one. So, uh, so the state has definitely got us enthusiastic about industrial hemp. We also have um, 10 educators from Cornell Cooperative Extension across the state that are involved in bringing information uh, to growers about how to grow hemp and, and uh, you know, what can we do this year in terms of hemp and how, where are we looking to the future. So that's really exciting. Uh, in terms of some of the research that we'll be doing, um, there is a research project actually um, that is run through Cornell, but uh, it's actually a state-funded project, where this year there are 29 farms that are involved in the research project. These are farms uh, that are all growing the same variety of industrial hemp. That variety is Anca. The reason we chose Anca was not some amazing scientific literature-driven reason. It's really the seed that we could get a hold of at the time we decided to do this large-scale project. Um, but it, it is a dual-purpose um, uh, variety of hemp, so it'll be interesting to see how it does on these 29 different farms. In terms of the research, we know what the history of the land that the Anca is being grown on. Um, we, know we have soil tests, and um, we'll have weather data. We'll have yield data, so uh, we'll know really it, how this variety does. We have farms from Lake Erie all the way down to Long Island. Uh, growers are amazingly entrepreneurial. We have growers that are growing for fiber and for seed. We also have um, growers that are uh, uh, growing plants in the greenhouse and transplanting them out uh, to extract the medicinal compounds, the non-hallucinogenic, non-THC uh, medicinal compounds, and they'll be selling those. And then we have growers that are actually harvesting two to three week old plants and using them uh, for baby greens uh, in salads and whatnot. So uh, I've been amazingly impressed, again, continually by the growers in the state of New York, how entrepreneurial you folks are, and um, all the different uses and, and creative ways that you can find to, to thrive uh, in this farming environment. It has been a tough year. We've had a lot of water. Uh, my background is in, sorry, Jen. My background is in uh, plant pathology. I study diseases of vegetables. And if you're a vegetable grower, you know it's been a tough year. It's been hard to get in because of all the rain. Um, but our growers have gotten the hemp in, it's gotten in late, and uh, we'll be enthusiastic to see what we learn at the end of the season. Um, in terms of other research projects, um, uh, Larry, and Larry Smart, who's a, a plant breeder um, in the School of Integrative Plant Science as well, uh, he and Don Vians are going to be establishing a breeding program. One of the things that we learned this year, we, Don's group knew last year, is that um, because of the permitting issues that Chris Logue will talk about, you know, moving seed across state or country lines can be extremely difficult. And so it would be really great to establish a seed production industry here in New York so that New York growers can buy seed produced in New York, um, uh, alleviating some of the permitting issues. And that will be coming online. Um, but but just starting a breeding program from scratch takes time. And so um, we're also working with um, local seed companies to try to find ways to import the seed more smoothly uh, than what happened this year. <laughs> um, additionally, uh, in that program, uh, we will be establishing a, um, 
uh, THC and CBD. CBDs are the non-hallucinogenic compounds, medicinal compounds produced by hemp. Uh, a testing facility that hopefully a year from now, um, both researchers and growers will be able to use um, to determine what varieties have uh, higher levels of those uh, medicinal compounds uh, when grown here in New York. So those compounds do change depending on the environment, depending on water content, and depending on heat. So uh, that's going to be an important aspect of our program. We have a plant pathologist that's going to be studying plant diseases. We have an entomologist that's looking at insects. We have a system scientist who's looking at how hemp fits into a rotational system. Um, we have uh, also, I, I, along with a microbiologist, are looking at uh, the microbiome. You've heard that you know what's in your gut and on your skin helps make you who you are, healthy and things like that. Well, we're actually going to be looking at the microbiome of hemp to see what kind of microbes grow on hemp and how that might impact some of the products that we get out of it. So that's some of the research uh, that we're going to be uh, doing at Cornell. Um, and, and we're really excited, actually, just to, to be involved with the growers and to learn from you guys you know, what your needs are, but also uh, what you're learning on your farms and how we can bring that back and feed those questions and those solutions into our research program. Um, I also want to say that we do have uh, another a field day in Geneva on um, uh, Tuesday, August 15th. So the Geneva plots, uh, we have, Cornell has a campus in Geneva, it's about an hour north of here. So we have four trials here that Don's group will talk about today. We have two identical trials to these four in Geneva. And um, those trials don't look quite like this. So when we're in Geneva, we'll actually be talking about some of the struggles that you might have if you're planting a hemp crop. Um, you know, this, this is beautiful. As I've heard, you know, some of the researchers are like, wow, if I knew it was going to look like this, it, you know, I'd, I'd grow it in a heartbeat. Um, but what happens when a field gets drowned out? What do things look like? Um, what disease and insect pressures do you have? And things like that. Um, so we'll have some of the extension folks there, and we'll talk about some of the, some of the issues that uh, you could have if you're, if you're growing a hemp crop. Um, and with that, I think I would turn it over to is it your folks. Back to Don. Um, some of you who have uh, stood up close to the hemp here may have noticed that these green varieties here that are in bloom um, there's a lot of bees in there, bumblebees and honeybees and so forth. They're really doing a lot of pollinating and apparently really love hemp uh, for a pollen source. Um, I also was thinking as I came out this morning and I was looking, um, not straight in this way, but um, from the other uh, direction, perpendicularly there, this stand is so thick that, um, that, that you could easily use this for, you know, like to have corn mazes and stuff like that, the pathways. <laughs> So, so maybe maybe once the re uh, regulations allow for that to happen, uh, we could have hemp mazes. So we'll, we'll see what happens in the future. Um, next up, uh, uh, we're going to have a couple of people from our research program talk about the actual trials that are going on here to uh, evaluate varieties for our conditions here in New York State. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, two people to come up. Jamie Crawford, who I really have to, um, to acknowledge has done a lot of work to make uh, the logistics of all of these things that we're doing with hemp happen. Um, she's been very instrumental to, to pulling off a lot of, of things there. So Jamie is a research support specialist on the uh, forage breeding project, which is the project that I lead. But of course, now we're into hemp um, research as well. And uh, along with her is Amelia uh, Yaffe, who is uh, actually completing an internship with us. Um, she's actually from SUNY Cobleskill and has to do an internship in order to complete her degree requirements there at Cobleskill. Uh, so she became interested in industrial hemp and uh, we took her on as a, an intern to work with the, the hemp project this summer and uh, has done a, a lot of really nice things there. So I'm going to turn it over to the two of them. Good morning. Um, I have a bunch of things to tell you and I knew I'd forget so you have actually a handout for what I'm going to talk about. It's called 2017 Industrial Hemp Trials. So um, the very first table on that sheet shows you our different locations for our trials and the planting dates. So the trial you see behind me right here, this, is, um, this one was planted June 9th. And you can see it's done very, very well. Um, the one directly behind me, this is our grain and dual purpose variety trial. 
And then we also had four entries that are exclusive fiber varieties. And so those are the next block down. So those of you interested in fiber should go and check those out as well. Um, so you can see we planted, well, Chris had mentioned how far behind the trials were in Geneva. They were planted later. So we planted a second trial on this exact same soil type the day after we planted the first Geneva trial. And that is what's down at the far end. So you could be able to see a little bit of a difference, the difference three weeks can make. Um, the varieties are still photo period sensitive. So you can see that even though they are much shorter, they're still starting to flower at about the same time. Um, within the last two weeks, luckily we've had uh, two people from different Canadian seed companies come and visit us. And they've said that even though it's planted later, it will still be harvested in, like, let's see. So since it's, there's a three week difference in planting, there'll probably be a week and a half difference in harvesting time. So it's, it's not going to be, you know, it's not the full three week difference for the harvest. So you can see our other trials on, on here. So we have one other trial here in Ithaca that was planted on, on what I would call a challenging soil. So it's what we plant, we planted a trial on it last year and what we planted with a grain drill. So it was planted about a one inch seeding depth. It just didn't come up at all. It was terrible. So we planted it this year with a forage seeder aiming for about a half inch seeding depth and then bad luck, right? About two days after we planted it, we got a rain and then two nights in the 40s. And so um, the emergence in that field is not what you see here. <laughs> As sort of an understatement. Uh, in the trial right behind me, we're averaging between, um, between 10 and 18 seedlings per square foot. And on that other trial I was just talking about, we were averaging between four and seven seedlings per square foot. So it was a big difference, a big difference. Um, and then we have the two trials planted in Geneva, one of them on a moderately well-drained soil and some on a somewhat poorly drained soil. So we know we have those in New York State. And then our last trial is on a gravel, it's the only one that had a lot of rocks. So our last trial was planted in an organic system in, on the, in Freeville. And so that was in, that was rotating out of red clover and then we planted hemp into it. So we're really looking forward to what we see in that one. So the plots behind me, each one is well, this is sort of the joke. Some one of the students pointed it out to me after I was printed out the. So our plots are four feet by twenty feet. So everyone can make a, a four twenty joke there. You have to have one at a hemp meeting, right? So, um, <laughs> and then each entry is replicated four times throughout each trial. Um, like I said, we, we were aiming with our grain drill for about three quarters of an inch for a seeding depth in all of our trials, except for the East Ithaca one, where we aim for half an inch. Um, and then if you want to look at the back, you can see a list of the varieties that we have in the trials. So we've got 13 varieties that are listed as grain or dual purpose. So the ones you see on the signs here the four fiber, tri four fiber entries, which you can see down there. And then there's also some <laughs> contact information for the seed companies that we got these varieties from. So for future trials, we do, we do hope to get more entries. Um, we want to be able to show for the farmers of New York State, you know, the full spectrum of what's available to them. So there's a couple other seed companies in Canada that ran out of seed this year, so we're hoping to get some of their entries from Parkland for next year. And um, yes, yeah. so next, Amelia is going to talk to you a little bit about some of the notes that we've taken. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, why didn't you just tissue culture the cannabis that grows organically here in indig indigenously in New York to start a project that already have cold weather and the soil hardiness cannabis hemp? I, it's, that would not be commercially available to farmers right now. Like the purpose of these trials right now is to see what farmers can purchase and plant in their fields 
right now. So like, yeah, I'm here to, I'm, I'm trying to talk to you about the variety trials that we have. That's part of a, a future breeding program, right? So the whole idea, we would, of course, you know, native hemp varieties are of interest in breeding programs, but for the trials, like this is what a farmer can get seed of and plant next spring. So that's, that's what we, we need to show. Okay, any other questions before I pass? Yes, sir. The, the variety there that has that's three weeks behind, do you expect it to grow to this extent or it will never do that? I don't think it will ever get quite this tall. Um, they were... I can answer that. Uh, once it starts the photo period change, it stops its uh, growth upward and uh, produces flower or seed. Uh, the gentleman who came last week, he, he is the one who markets Anka, so Reuben Stone. He was saying that they have areas where they've planted Anka in beginning of May, and that's like 15 feet tall. So, um, yes. Jamie, aren't there, there are a few varieties that are photo period insensitive? I, I thought that one up in Canada that's uh, called Stars of the Nest. Um, it's totally I think that's what Larry Square actually wants to breed. There's nothing that's day neutral yet, but that would be the, one of the first goals of the breeding program yeah. here. I thought there was already something built in that brand new thing. It's auto plus. It's auto plus. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so um, I'll bring in Amelia, and she's going to talk about some of the notes that we've taken on the trials so far. Hi, so. Um, I'm the research intern, and with the help of some of our student employees, I've been collecting data on our trials um, on a weekly basis. Most of these data include notes on uh, height, stand, and flowering. As you can see, all of our varieties um, are, flower are in bloom now. I think the fiber may just be beginning. Uh, the fiber varieties have been much slower um, to, to begin. Um, and something I've noticed is there's vast differences between our monoecious and dioecious varieties. And for those of you who don't know, um, dioecious varieties are the ones that have male and uh, female plants that are separate. And monoecious plants produce male and female parts on the same plant. Um, all of our dioecious varieties um, began to bloom uh, sooner and they had um, they did so much more vigorously at first, and then their growth sort of slowed down, whereas the uh, monoecious varieties have continued to um, grow a lot more, at a much more steady and linear rate. Um, we plan on combining the, our grain and dual purpose varieties um, in the fall when about 70% of the seeds are mature. Um, so we're expecting to do that probably September, October. And our fiber trial will be harvested uh, when 20% flowering occurs. So that's all we have for now. There was, there was a note in one of your um, handouts that the, the monoecious are only used for breeding. They're not generally put in the field. I was just curious why. Well, there are, there are breeding varieties um, that are monoecious. I think there's some varieties already. Okay. Says, the just because yeah. you just had a comment that said monoecious cultivars are generally only grown by plant breeders, is that that they're just not in advance, or is that they produce less seed, or? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure that that's true, because a lot of people prefer monoecious varieties because they won't lose 40% of their crop due to dead male plants. Yeah, so. that's why I was just curious. Yeah. Will you be using the seed from these in future plantings? What about cross pollination right. between any of them? No. Right. Um, no, we plant we plant certified seed in our trials, and so we won't be saving any seed. But we will test the quality of these seeds for um, different oil production. But when it comes to planting again, we're going back to the certified seed bags. And it's illegal. Let me just point out that it is in fact illegal to save the seed. Why, why is that? Uh, Chris? So you Chris have to buy it every year. 
Okay, it's federal DEA. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not an intellectual property. It is. Well, there yeah, is. That's, 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 yeah, that's part, that, there are some varieties that you can sign an MTA with, but it's also an illegal discretion. At least our permit our permit does not allow us to hold the six. <laughs> Can you call me the plants? Right. But there they're are flowered now, but if it's not an investigator, is that legal? No. So what are the flowers? Unless, um, I mean, under your, if you have a license to do that, so then it's illegal. Then it is legal. But okay, but it's illegal. Oh, sorry, the question was, can you clone the plants? Can you put them into tissue culture? And that's absolutely something that we're going to be doing here at Cornell. In fact, the director of our tissue culture facility is here today. Um, but you have to have the appropriate licensing from the company who sold you the seed, and you also have to have the appropriate permits so that Matthew doesn't get thrown in jail. We, we like him, and we like him, Matthew. <laughs> Um, will breeding efforts uh, focus on varieties or strategies that won't necessarily incur as many licensing issues or material transfer agreements for farmers? That will not encourage? Well, I mean, so like eventually, ideally, people will, will be able to save <coughs> seed from hemp and won't be breeding from varieties that might previously have such um, restrictions on them. Okay. Mm. I think. In Colorado or the only states that have yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't quite hear the whole question there. Something about the breeding. What? Well, well, I guess some of these varieties, um, I have licensing agreements that you can't repeatedly save seed. Right. Is that legally towards the companies that own the variety <coughs> on top of federal regulation? Oh yes, that's so. That's absolutely right. That happens with uh, most crop species. Uh, even with alfalfa that you see the plots behind you there uh, that we work with on a project as well. Um, uh, especially the private companies will uh, go through what's called a, a plant variety protection. Uh, some will actually patent their varieties. And so that's a legal process. So that makes sure that, that you or I cannot pirate they, their seed and call it our own variety. Uh, they put all, all the expense into the research and development of that variety and producing the seed and so forth. They want to protect it so that they can get some payback so that it continue with, with their efforts there. Uh, so that's just part of the legal protection system. Uh, it's not part of the Drug Enforcement Agency or anything like that, uh, but it's just, just part of the system to, to make sure that uh, companies are protecting their own interests and so forth. And, and I don't say that in a selfish way. That's that's kind of the way it needs to be in order for companies to have the incentive to put all the, the funding into research and development of products like this. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm just wondering if you then breed off of varieties that um, have those protections, do yeah. those so, like just continue forward? On? So if we do that, uh, we need to go to that company and ask if they would allow us to do that and, and, and sign an agreement. And of course, we'd have to pay them a royalty on, on um, any varieties that we develop from their materials. Uh, usually there's a royalty basis uh, per pound of seed, you know, so many cents per pound of seed that we have to pay back to them. There's a couple, patent attorney over here, there's a couple different issues going on. You may actually be able to patent a gene sequence. You can't patent the whole genome, but you might be able to patent a sequence that gives it a particular characteristic. In that case, any of us wouldn't be able to grow a, a hemp plant with that particular gene sequence in it because then we would be violating their patent. Um, but if you enter into a license agreement with one of these companies, then there's a potentially additional restrictions on top of whether or not you can actually breed with their plant. Technically, you know, by the patent law itself, if you breed with their plant and then produce something without that patented gene sequence, you might technically be okay by the patent laws but by the license agreement, you, you might not be okay. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about yeah. anything related to that? Yes. Do you have any plans to test auto flower for oil? Mm -hmm. Auto flower? Yeah. Uh, we haven't thought about that, at least I haven't, but that might be an interesting thing to do. That's, yeah, that's the short growth cycle. Yes. How much the seeds cost? How much the seed costs? Uh, Jamie, what do we have to pay for that? We need to give you the mic there. So for the seed cost, it's it's probably two dollars and fifty cents to three dollars a pound for the seed, and then you pay for all of the testing that they have to do through APHIS to get it imported to the United States, and then the shipping is extensive on top of that as well. 
and then I don't know what did we work it out to Chris do you remember like it was uh, 50 roughly fifty dollars an acre yeah roughly fifty dollars an acre for the seed pot that was for that was for Anka that, yeah that was also when we bought it in bulk so we bought fifty one thousand pounds of it and got it at about fifty so it would be about fifty dollars per acre how many pounds per acre 30. Yeah, so the question was how many pounds per acre, and we were planning at 30 pounds per acre, which was about the $50 range. Yes? In addition to testing for the oil quality and the fiber content, will you take a look at the pharmaceutical value of this crop, even though I know it's not intended for that purpose? Yes, we're very interested in doing that. So. Uh uh, what we would like to do is that, I mean, SUNY Binghamton has a pharmaceutical school now, yeah. and uh, we've, we talked to them about a year ago about interest. I know they're working with some other people now, too, but, uh, but we would like to get some people interested in looking at that. Right, so the question was, I think, if I heard it right, I think the question was, are we going to be looking at other non-THC medicinal compounds? Yeah, basically. Yeah, so um, uh, this year, again, we're getting that up and running, so we'll just do it as a one-shot deal. We have... Um, uh, at Cornell, our uh, BRC Bio Resource Center um, will be gearing up for that. So we'll test for THC and then for the um, cannabinoid panel. Uh, and then next year, the idea is that you know we'd, we'd have more time to plan a, a more rigorous scientific study, and and uh, we would probably do um, different timings. But at least for this year, we'll get. Um, information from the 17 varieties at least a snapshot uh, and we'll do that for each of our six locations that has the varieties yeah, i'm glad thanks for clarifying that chris because yeah we can't we're not doing everything this year this is our initial year but in the future we would like to do that so yes uh don same question i asked you before about harvesting equipment so i to sort of throw it out if if you guys have what are you guys doing for combines or making uh adjustments to your combines or if there's any special equipment you guys are looking into or if anyone has yeah, so I, th so I think that's a general question for everybody. Um, Ed and I were talking about that before we started here, uh, about harvest equipment that you use. And it would probably be different for the fiber varieties versus the grain and dual purpose varieties. I mean, I've heard, I've read that, um, that people have used the combine for the grain and dual purpose types, but sometimes there can be some problems with, um, with all this stalk material wrapping around the, the components of the combine. Um, so that is an issue. Anybody have any experience with that or thoughts on that? My clients in North Carolina are using uh, hand decorticators. Uh, using what? A hand what? Hand decorticators. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. I know a farmer in Vermont that actually left a remainder of the hemp field because it took about two or three days just to combine four acres. Oh, really? Um, oh. And they had to repeatedly stop and unwind the combine and uh, resharpen the blades and whatnot because the fiber was just too much for their John Deere combine. Yeah. So that could be an issue. And I know that's a common issue um, throughout the hemp industry right now is the harvesting of it. Yeah, so that's that's something where um, some, some agricultural <coughs> engineers could come in handy to, to work out that system. But there is, I mean, obviously there's a lot of fiber in there. Even in the grain types, there's a lot of fiber. I mean, otherwise, this tall material wouldn't stand up like it would. I mean, we're just catching up with the rest of the world here. Are there the machines in other countries? Australia. Yeah. Australia. Yeah. They have one that does it all in the yeah. 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 It's a yeah. historic yeah. challenge, though. It's yeah. always yeah. been yeah. a challenge, the hemp industry. Always. I, my company is associated with uh, some partners from the University of Taiwan, and uh, we've been doing this in China for, they've been doing this in China for many, many years, essentially. You could buy a piece of machinery that actually separates all of it. Seeds, huh. oil, uh, any any part of the stack. So what is your company name again? <laughs> the, the Industries. What was that? You have to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my business card. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, other questions before we go on to the next speaker? <laughs> Okay. Um, here and then here. I'm curious what you'll be doing next year or any research on like the systems work, what follows hemp well, how to deal with all the fiber in the field for next year. Yeah, I mean Chris can help me answer that because she's been, she and, she and uh, Larry Smart have been thinking about this. I mean one of the things that we want to do too, right now we just have uh, these, these um, variety trials just on Cornell land. 
we would like to spread that out some throughout the state. I mean, right now, producers, several producer, producers are just growing uh, Anca, but we would like to get some variety trials more widespread so we can get a better idea of the best varieties for New York State conditions, not just on our experimental farmland. Um, so that's one, but Chris, I don't know if you want to contribute more to that. Uh, can you guys all hear me? So, um, yeah, in, in terms of on-farm or, or rotational strategies, um, there's a scientist, Matt Ryan, who's in the soil and crop science uh, section of SIPS, and he's going to be looking at integrating hemp into his system study. And then in addition to that, I think, you know, one of the things that we can do fairly, fairly easily is right now we're looking at what is hemp following at the 29 farms. And there's some interesting things because there were some growers that, you know, sprayed uh, and were ready to prep, prep for soybean, but they couldn't get their soybean in because of the rain and now they're putting hemp in. So we'll be able to tell, you know, do the herbicides that were put on to prep for soybean, are they attacking, you know, are they an issue for hemp? So in some ways the 29 farms are helping us with that. The other thing that will be help with is that we can go back to them next year and see if they're having issues, you know, what are they following and are they having issues so we can follow that for a while. So, so right now we are developing our systems approach, but we can use the 29 farms sort of as a, as a real life, you know, scientific study to see what happens. So, um, and any of you, you know, if you, if you, once you guys start growing hemp and, you know, anything that you found has, has affected the hemp, either that you did before the hemp goes in the ground or after it's coming off going in the next year, I mean, that's all really valuable information that, you know, we hope to learn from you guys. Any other questions before we move on? Yes. I was curious to know if you watered this or if you just relied on Not rain. Not this year. <laughs> yeah, it's, we've had plenty of rain. You did irrigate it once to start with, didn't you, Jamie? Um, we had one dry spell in June, and at that time we weren't sure the DEA was going to allow us to plant in all of our locations, so like, we need this to survive. So we did irrigate it um, for, I don't know, just a couple hours one morning at the very early seedling stage, but um, none of the other trials were irrigated. We just were just like, we need this to survive. What happens if it cooks? And so there was an act of desperation here just to make sure. But, um, and it turns out it probably would have been fine. But, uh, <laughs> but none of the other trials have been irrigated. Yeah, obviously it's been an unusual year. Um, last year was so dry and this year is so wet. And if you put the two years together, it averages out. But, but that's not the way the plants act. They don't uh, work on averages. Um, so, you know, with all the rain that we've had this season, each week we wonder, well, is the fall going to turn off and then it's going to turn dry the rest of the summer? And, and you just never know, but it's, it's just, it just keeps on going. So, so with, I mean, we got this planted late, later, maybe several weeks, maybe a month later than what we really wanted to plant it, but yet it's, it's growing very tall. And so, you know, we've had plenty of moisture to keep it going this season. So. Other questions? Yes. Do you have any faculty positions opening up at Cornell or anyone know for cannabis genetics? I know a lot of people, you, people are kind of taking on this as a new plant, but what about people who specialize in hemp and cannabis? Yeah, I'm going to turn that over to Chris, but I'm not aware of any new faculty positions right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we do have new faculty positions, but uh, the, the ones that we have right now are not, um, they're not hemp related. <laughs> um, well, so I think actually to, to answer that question quite seriously, I think that I think that um, hiring a faculty member for a 40, 30 or 40 year stint or a 20, 30 year stint, um, you know, is a, is a serious endeavor and, and I think that we don't know yet how well hemp is going to do in New York. I mean, this is really the first time that it's been out. And so, you know, I think we need to give it a season or two to figure out how we plug that in to our research portfolio um, and, and footprint across the state, you know, to make sure that, you know, we still have, have folks that are working with our vegetable growers and our field crops growers, um, you know, just to make sure we're very well-rounded. And so I think um, the people that are on hemp are, you know, we're all in and I, I feel like you know, we're, we're covering it quite well, and um, in the future, if it continues to expand, then we would certainly look into that area. I mean, we have the advantage, Chris mentioned earlier, that there are 11 of us um, on the faculty working on this, and um, 
uh, we're, we're all coming from our different areas of specializations put together as a package where we're cooperating together to you know to, put, to look at the complete package so it's not just breeding or genetics but it's all different areas of, of research that we're uh, working on here and, and that's really what it's going to take that's what it's going to take the work because it's not just one area of specialization that we need to be focusing on but we need to look at all aspects of, of production and so forth so okay yes Hi, I'm curious, uh, is there thought about uh, building communities in terms of um, uh, worker cooperatives and such so that uh, the extraction <coughs> devices and the processing devices can be bought back to the farm, farming communities? You know, that's all where all the money is. You know, it's one thing to grow the plant, but to manufacture and farm and, and to process uh, into, you know, the 500 different uses, that's where really the money is. So I'm wondering if there's thought about that. Yeah, so I'm not totally sure what your question is something about the various sure. uses. Sure, bringing it. the equipment back to the farm. So, in, for yeah. instance, in North Carolina, there's a big movement uh, about building farm, uh, worker cooperatives where they will buy the extraction oh, oh, equipment so that the farm, that, that money stays on the farm. Okay. Right? We're seeing this in marijuana on the West Coast. Farmers don't make any money. It's all in the processing and, and building the market. So I'm curious as to whether Cornell or New York State is thoughtful in thinking about building those sort of marketability. Yeah, so we, so we Cheryl have from Parks, New York, I okay. think is here. Pardon me? Cheryl, are you here? There you are. Oh, okay. Yes, so we have Cheryl from Harvest New York, uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension. No, and I don't have an answer to that right now. I am familiar with what's going on in North Carolina. I don't know that any thoughts been given that to that yet. I would say too, it, it's just too new yet so far. Um, so um, I know Chris is. Where's Chris? Right here. He's going to be talking about talking about processors towards the end of it. Um, but I don't have an answer right now to that. It's a great question, though. Um, let me move on. We'll, we'll have more opportunities for questions. We're not done yet this morning, um, but let me move on. Before I introduce the next speaker, though, um, I might mention, some of you may have noticed or maybe you didn't notice the tall fence that's around our experimental farm here. Um, so that um, fence is there because we have a lot of deer problems around here. And, um, you, you know, you see some forage species behind you, alfalfa and so forth. If we didn't have some way to control the deer, um, we wouldn't be able to, to collect the data for our research purposes that we need to collect. So, so I don't know, I mean, people have asked me if deer are a problem on hemp, and I don't, really don't know the answer to that. We haven't had experience with it yet. Have, have any of you uh, heard anything about whether deer will bother hemp at all? Yes? Uh, in Vermont, um, I was told that the seedlings, um, the deer really liked, but as the hemp grew tall and more fibrous, the deer just left it alone. Oh, okay. Too much fiber in there. <laughs> so so <laughs> it, might, it might depend on the cultivar, really. So like if, we, if we didn't have this fence here, they would be eating our alfalfa, but leaving the hemp alone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I talked to someone in Colorado who said he wished he had fences Oh, okay. Do you know if it's mainly on uh, on, on young growth? Yeah, he was plants. growing for CBD, but he didn't say at what point they were using. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm growing for CBD in Oregon, and we've had no problem with deer at all. We have multiple, like four different farms going right now, oh, different okay. areas, so we've been very fortunate. None of them have passed in. Okay. Did everybody hear that? So he said in Oregon they, they haven't had any problems at all with deer. Okay, let me introduce the next speaker. Um, you know, anytime you have a, a more and more acreage of any kind of a crop species, and, and right now we don't have that, a lot of acreage, but it's, it's growing. Um, but whenever you have that, um, it's, it's going to be susceptible to various disease and insect problems. Um, so Dr. Gary Bergstrom, he's the, um, the chair of the department or of the section of plant pathology and plant microbiology within the School of Integrated Plant Science. Uh, and he does a lot of research and extension activities on diseases of field crops. And um, Elson Shields, our entomologist, was going to be here. Uh, but he's, um, uh, some things came up and he's not able to be here today, but he did tell me uh, about a few insect problems, but Gary, if you've seen any insects no, in your, okay, no, I'll let you talk about diseases okay. first. Gary. Thanks, Don. So uh, I, I uh, will confess that I'm, I'm a student of, a, uh, of uh, hemp diseases at this point and trying to learn everything I can along, I suspect, with a lot of you here. So uh, as, as Don said, I've worked in, uh, in field crops for a number of years, and uh, we uh, are, are looking forward to getting a better handle and inventory on what some of the pest problems are on industrial hemp. And I've also spent some time talking to some colleagues in some other parts of the country and some of these recent visitors from Canada about some of the things they've encountered. 
But uh, by and large, we're going to use these variety plots uh, in Ithaca, Geneva, and other places, and these distributed farms across New York State to try to inventory all of the uh, pest issues that, uh, that we find. And typical for a new crop like this, uh, a lot of these pathogens tend to be rather specific in the, in the crop species that they attack. So we could reasonably expect as we expand the acreage and intensity of the crop, uh, we may not see a lot of these pest problems now, but we, uh, we can anticipate that they would increase uh, the more that we grow the crop uh, intensively on a particular farm or, or more extensively. Uh, so I think most of you are aware there are no pesticides of any class uh, used on the crop at this point, and that includes fungicides, and that also includes uh, seed uh, treatment fungicides. Uh, Dr. Alan Taylor is going to talk a little bit later uh, on the program about uh, some seed treatment technology. Uh, one of the things we would be concerned about is what protection we need to get these seed, seed, seedlings uh, out of the ground. And uh, we, one thing we have noticed in a number of the locations at, at, at fairly low incidence, not really causing an economic problem, but we could see even in this fairly dry season, uh, we have seen a number of the water mold uh, uh, pathogens attacking the, the uh, seed and seedlings uh, that under less favorable conditions for sowing the crop, we could anticipate more problem. And uh, in the vast majority of field crops and vegetables, we, uh, except for strictly organic production, there's often a, uh, a, a seed applied uh, fungicide or water mold active uh, material. So that's something that we would be looking at in the future as a, a possible uh, means of controlling some of these problems. Um, we've also seen a, a fairly small incidence of some, uh, of some wilting and, and crown and root symptoms at, at low incidence. And I could uh, share a whole long list of Latin names with you of the kind of organisms that we're finding there. But at this, this point, we're just taking an inventory. And uh, some of this goes back to what Chris was talking about, the microbiome. There are a lot of fungi and bacteria and other things that are just normally present. And uh, just to find some of these things doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're causing some kind of a plague on industrial hemp. So part of the research going forward will be taking some of these organisms, uh, trying to inoculate them onto healthy plants and seeing if they do uh, cause disease. And uh, down the road, uh, I mean, I'm very excited about this uh, breeding program that will be going on. We'll look at some of the principal uh, plant pathogens that we find associated with the crop and maybe doing, uh, or someone in the future will be doing some purposeful screening of some of these varieties with some of these uh, potential pathogen problems. Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times about cropping rotations. And as a plant pathologist, that's, that's a, a center focus for me, is not only can the uh, organism survive in the soil or potentially come in with the seed, but in many cases, uh, some of these organisms uh, will survive on the debris that's left behind in the field, and that be the bridge from one growing season to another. And coming back, what I said about the specificity of many of these crop diseases. Uh, so for an instance, if we were planting this crop after a, a grain crop like corn or something like that, or a small grain, there'd be very, very few organisms that would interact and cause problems on those two crops. Uh, the closer they are related, uh, so we could expect some dicot plants to be a little more closely related uh, to the uh, hemp than, than some of our monocots. So we're going to be looking over time to see if there's any carryover of some of these pests. One that does concern me long term and has been a problem in Canada and some other places is white mold. Uh, it's a fungal problem that is already quite uh, rampant in our legume crops and some of our other broadleaf vegetable crops. So in soybean production, probably our biggest disease problem right now is, uh, is sclerotinia uh, white mold. And that's a very broad host range fungus and it survives the survival structures of the fungus called sclerotia. They will survive in the soil for a number of years. 
And uh, so certainly white mold is something we'll be looking at in the hemp, and particularly in rotations that would include vegetable beans, dry beans, uh, soybean, things, highly susceptible crops to, to white mold. So uh, rotations are very important in this sense as well. Um, so I don't want to talk at you a lot here. I want to make you aware that, uh, that we're very interested in learning more. Uh, first about what the diseases and potential disease problems might be and obviously uh, the long-term interest is how to manage those. Uh, I will mention uh, two people from my program, Kevin Myers in the back here and Jamie Cummings will be working in our lab to do a lot of the diagnosis and uh, uh, of potential disease problems and, and work with this uh, with this new crop. So uh, we would be appreciative of anybody seeing anything in their fields um, and, and letting us know. Uh, we'd be glad to diagnose problems in our laboratory, get out in your fields and look. So please please keep us informed and let us know how, how we can be of help to you. So um, another thing just to quickly say that one of the main advantages against diseases is just the vigorous rapid growth of this crop. And that's one of the things I've, I've learned from talking to colleagues in other places. Yeah, we see some leaf spots. Yeah, we see some of this and that. Uh, but the crop basically outgrows them. And, and that is an advantage uh, with this crop, uh, and that it's timely planted in appropriate soils. Um, another thing, we're not weed scientists in our, in our program, but uh, Kevin has been taking some notes in the various plots about weed density and you know a great take home message here is he said a, a tremendous correlation between the weed uh, density in these plots and what the original stand was from the emergence, uh, success and emergence of those plots. So the best defense against weeds, especially in the ab absence of any herbicides to use, is just to have a good crop establishment, have a good initial stand and very often uh, th this will be sufficient to uh, outcompete the weeds. So a pretty good strategy if you can do that. Any, any questions or comments, some observations others have made? Yeah, please. What is the closest uh, normal plant in New York that family relationship to hemp? And if you... Uh, I, I would say hops. Okay, hops, hops would be the closest. Can you then say that whatever attacks hops, diseases or pests, is similarly probably going to only as a very general uh, uh, statement, uh, e even within a, a plant family, there's tremendous specificity in, uh, in these pathogens. There are some things that would be candidates that way. A lot of the things that attack through the soil, the water molds, the fusaria, uh, rhizoctonia, some of these things t tend to have a fairly wide host range. A lot of the leaf spotting type organisms are really rather specific. Um, and I think things like the downy mildews, Chris, would be pretty separate from the hops and the and the uh, the hemp in this case. So uh, the more this, the more pathogen is specialized, uh, the the you know the less we worry about that uh, for related crops. But definitely, that's something we'd be looking at. And there are some candidate things we'd be looking at. Uh, but I still come back to, to white mold being the biggest concern that way because it's a very broad host range to weeds as well as cultivated crops. Anybody observe anything in your, uh, on your farms at this point? Uh, okay, we'll keep us in mind if we can help. Yeah, David. Gary, in, in regard to some of the pests, uh, Farm Viability is funding uh, Jen Gilbert Jenkins at Morrisville with some plots this summer specifically to look at insect pests. I don't know that she's doing much with diseases, but certainly okay. with insects. And so, uh, so she um, might have some good information Chris, to share Chris as well. Becker has been interacting with her, and we have had a few things arrive at either Chris's lab or mine in connection with that. But yeah, we would absolutely love to plug in with that and get all the learning we can out of, out, out of these plots that are established, yeah. And we've also provided funding for her. She's planning to do a statewide uh, trial next summer on uh, fertilization in hemp okay. and on uh, 10 different farms around the state. So Very interesting. We provided some funding for her to, to buy the seed already for that. So. Well, that's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Don, would you like to say a few things about uh, what uh, insects that... Uh, yeah, so again, Elson Shields has been working on this. He's in our entomology department, but unfortunately, 
he was not able to make it here after all. Uh, but he did send me a, a list of a few insects that he's observed in the, uh, the hemp uh, around the state so far. Uh, one of them is uh, a ligus bug, it's maybe a quarter inch uh, big bug there that um, eats the growing tips of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the plant, but also the reproductive parts, the floral parts of the plant, which obviously could be very critical on the grain types or the dual purpose types there. So that's one of the things that he's keeping a watch on. Another insect, um, which is actually prevalent on a lot of species, is potato leaf hopper. And we have problems with that on our alfalfa. Uh, if we don't spray an insecticide or use a resistant variety. Uh, but apparently he's been seeing it on, on industrial hemp as well. A third one that he mentioned is thrips. That's a very, very small insect, uh, but that can get into the floral parts. Uh, they eat pollen and so forth. Um, and th some of the things, Elson didn't mention it, but some of the things that I've read is that uh, people are suspecting that some of the major insect problems on corn could actually be a problem on hemp too. Uh, I don't know the validity of that or whether people are speculating at this point, but things like corn armory worm and some others there. So, so it is critical that uh, entomologists be looking, just like Gary does with the diseases there, that we have entomologists looking at insect problems um, so that we know what uh, challenges that we have in front of us. So, um, so if you have questions about insects, I probably can't answer them, but you can ask. I would think that the insect pressure would build over time once there's more crop available. Oh, absolutely. Same for diseases and insects. Uh, you know, as, as the acreage increases across the state, um, certainly there's potential for more problems to be there as well. Good point. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay, so um, I'm going to turn this over then to uh, Dr. Alan Taylor. Um, one of the problems that we've already been confronted with, there's one of these varieties in here, which I think is this short one, is it, Jamie, that had low germination? Uh, one of these was, anyway. Oh, is it down there? Okay. But one of the varieties um, was from seed that was a year older than the rest of them, and the germination rate was really low. And uh, even though Jamie compensated with that to have the same number of pure live seeds per square foot, so that we're comparing apples and apples and not apples and oranges, um, still the, um, the stand density was not as great as some of the other varieties. So the seed's important. As Gary said, we need to get a, a good stand establishment. So we're very pleased that Dr. Alan Taylor from the horticulture section in the School of Integrated Plant Science is working on the, the seed aspects of this. Thanks, Don, for the, the introduction. As Chris mentioned, there's a number of states that have really have doing research on hemp. And uh, a colleague of mine from North Dakota State as an agronomist was given a talk last year and really talking about seed quality issues, the stand establishment issues, a lot of these seed related things. And my program here at Cornell at the Geneva Ag Experiment Station, we interact with a lot of different crops, vegetable crops, but also industrial crops. So I thought at the time, I said, this would be really a good uh, project for my laboratory to get involved in and then here less than a year later here we are whereas Chris says we have this Cornell hemp team it's really a consortium of faculty uh, with a wide range of expertise all kind of focus on this so I think we're going to be able to make quite a bit of uh, progress in a relatively short amount of time as we're we're working on this also as Chris mentioned really good partnership with ag and markets and things like that and being able to uh, kind of work at the regulatory level with this and getting it out as well as the research and the outreach that we're really so good at here at Cornell. We obviously see as we're looking at here that that with seed obviously the plant breeding and genetics has a key role in what the plant growth and development is but another key aspect of seed is is the seed quality and really the quality assurance as you're buying seed, if you're spending that at least $50 an acre to establish, it's a major input into growing a, a, really a field crop like as an agronomic crop as hemp would be. So you want to make sure that you're really, first of all, getting the good quality seed. Um, as right now for these trials, we have all the, the uh, the grain types or the multi-purpose types here and there's also other trials with the fiber types. We have 17 seed lots that we're working on. Uh, about half of those are from Canada, the, the rest are from Europe, from Eastern Europe, Poland, Ukraine, over to Italy, France are the production, the origin of those seeds. So we're looking at a pretty good kind of cross-section of commercial seed. 
all those seeds have to be imported here into the United States. So there are aspects that really need to be addressed as far as the quality for that sort of uh, commerce coming into this country. And there's really two aspects of seed quality. We always think of, well, the seed's got to germinate to grow. Definitely the case. But another aspect, especially those that are not involved with agronomic crops or, or different seeded crops, is what we call the seed purity. What the purity is, is if you're buying a bag of seed, and that could be a bag of wheat, could be a bag of hemp seeds, is what else is in that bag? You want, for example, down there, you want the hemp, this is the Anka variety, but what else could be in that bag? There could be weed seeds present, there could be other crop seeds present, and also what we just generically call as inert material, just other materials, which could be broken seeds, trash materials, stones, things like that. So in the 17 seed lots that we're working with now, uh, Michael Luce, who uh, works in my program, he was the former manager of, the, of our New York State Seed Testing Laboratory, and that seed testing laboratory has now moved to Albany. But with Michael's actually running the, uh, the germinations and the purities on those, we're seeing some of these seed lots. And again, I don't have enough data right now, we're still doing this to have as a handout. But some of these over 5% inert material. So, Basically, we'd say it's pretty trashy seed that we're getting. Again, if somebody's buying this, you want to make sure that you're getting good quality seed. But probably the, the, the two keys that we're really concerned about in this purity are weed seeds. For us to import seeds, to receive the seeds, uh, there has to be an APHIS permit conducted where that what we call a noxious weed exam. And noxious weeds are seeds which are really defined by law that are harmful to agriculture. So you don't want to have those in the bag because you're also planting those. And also just other common weed seeds, things like that that may also be present. So, so we're going through these samples right now in, in just kind of testing, trying to get as much information on the quality aspect. For example, with the, the Canadian seed lots that we've gotten as their close partners to us, they have their seed certification system, just like Phil has a seed certification program here. The basis of the two programs are the same as we look at seed certification. They have different levels. They have a certification number one level and number two. So how do those differ? They really differ based on the quality. The level one is the high quality seed. And so the germination uh, needs to be 85% or higher and just two uh, weed seeds can be present in just one other crop seed in a 25 gram sample. Where are these other crop seeds coming from, you ask? We do, we do not have a herbicide that can be used in the seed production field. So if there was oats, and we've seen oats uh, as, as contaminants as other crop seeds, sunflower, a lot of those seeds are also coming over in your seed. So again, we want that to be as clean as possible. Just as we've, uh, again, let's use that criteria with the 85% germination and the 70% germination. Of the 17 seed lots that is being tested within the Cornell system this year, only five of those had 85% germination and higher. So again, we really need to have high quality seeds for that good initial stand establishment. Nine of those, which is about half, had over 70%. So, so again, what, you know, when this events up to be a commercial crop, what you're getting is very important because that really starts the basis for that. So that's kind of where we're at right now is in this, I'll say, characterization, the quality assurance aspect to make sure that the farmer ultimately has high quality seed. The next part is, it's already been mentioned, there are issues, early germination events, early seedling emergence stand establishment issues with the hemp crop. And again, I learned from this from my colleagues in out of state, so this is not a New York problem. It's not unique to us. They have the problems in Canada, they have it throughout. The seeds in themselves, I'll just say, are just have generally a low vigor, they tend to be weak germinators. Once they get going, you can see they, they grow like heck. But it's that early phase, which is a very, very sensitive phase, and we need to get the plant establishment, again, for that crop to canopy, which is providing the weed management as well. So, so everything really rotates on getting off to a good start with the hemp seed. 
Now, since we're not able to use uh, labeled of chemical pesticides, including chemical seed treatments, then w my laboratory is interested from the research point of view of looking at some development of some technology. So that'll be kind of where we're going with our research. Two areas. One is Gary mentioned uh, a lot of the, the damping off organisms that are going to be ubiquitous in our soils here, pythiums, things like that. What sort of a, a, of a seed treatment could we use? Not a chemical seed treatment, like a captan or thyram or, or an apron, but what else could we use that we could still apply? And so we're kind of going to our toolbox where I work with organic vegetable seed productions, and not seed production, but seed quality as well. And so what can we take from that area as an organic seed treatment? So that's an area that we're going to be moving into that, so we can get some protection uh, from some of these early uh, attacking early soil borne pathogens. The second aspect is again they are inherently low vigor seeds and again we don't know enough yet to really to be able to really define the vigor except doing a germination test but we're, we're relying on on people that have worked in this crop for a long time. So in that regards, uh, again, kind of some other work that we're doing is what we're calling biostimulants. Biostimulants are compounds, these are not pesticides, that are applied to plants to enhance plant growth and development. So we've already done work with seed treatments with some of these biostimulant type of materials, natural type of materials, no pesticidal effect on them at all. What would they do to a hemp seed? So again, you know, we have a lot to do ahead of us, so we'll be ready for next growing season to actually to test some of these things. But that kind of gives you in kind of a, a quick summary where the seed science and technology program is at the Geneva Ag Experiment Station with Cornell, uh, focusing right now in the seed testing aspect, seed quality, just to make sure we, we can characterize the seed lots that we're working with, but then the, the future research and development really, kind of rolling up our sleeves and developing some very practical seed treatments that could be used on hemp seeds to enhance plant establishment and early season growth. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions along the seed line? Yes. I'm surprised by the substantial reduction in germination from that 2017 to 2016 lots. It was my understanding was that 2016 lot was the one that needed to have the seeding rate adjusted. And I'm wondering if that's somewhat more unique to hemp, maybe because of the high oil content, because um, most other crops I'm familiar with wouldn't show such a dramatic difference between those just one year as long as that seed was handled reasonably well. A, a really good question, and we're looking at the issues of seed quality, but also in the case uh, if we have carryover seeds, uh, things like that. Uh, there are uh, kind of as we look kind of across the board of seeds, some seeds are just naturally short-lived seed, like a soybean happens to be a short-lived seed. Other crops just tend to be like a tomato seed is a very long-lived. So there's just sort of like my lifespan compared to you know the, my pet dog. The dog has a shorter natural lifespan than I do. So you have some of that. So so the hemp kind of fits into that as far as just the genetic basis. It, it is a high oil content seeds, but some seeds. So there's not a strict rule of thumb on, on oil content. For example, the tomato seeds, which is a very long lived seed, is a very high oil or lipid content seed. So there's a lot of things we really don't know. But, but from, again, kind of what we have seen is that the storage, especially in a carryover situation, can be an issue. And so, for example, the, these companies that uh, we've talked about up in Canada, the seeds that they're producing last year are the seeds that we're using. So they, they're produced, harvested, they have to be carried over. Of these three seed lots of Anka that we got, all the same variety, three different seed lots. From, this is from their germination conducted up in Canada. From two are in the upper 80s, one is in the 70. And I said, why? 
you know, in, in a nice sort of a way. Why did that happen? Are these carryover seeds? And they said, no, they're all harvested. One was harvested a little later and may have had a little bit higher moisture content that went into that overwinter storage. That higher moisture, the seeds are just going to age faster. So, so there is just, so you can't even say variety how things are going to respond. You really have to look at the seed lot level. But even like I said, in the example where we have lots and lots of that seeds for the commercial uh, uh, use this year, there are differences between those three seed lots. And again, they are attributing it just to that it's higher moisture content. We can check that moisture content. We have, you know, we can, we can look at that. But after the aging has happened in seed store, there's nothing we, we, we can't go retro on this, but, but at least we can characterize that as knowing what the, uh, the moisture should be and safe storage. Very good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. That moisture content, is that dictated by when you harvest? Early harvest, more moisture, late harvest, less moisture, as an example, is that, what, is that possible? So, so what is going on during seed development in the later phases of seed development is, is the seed on the mother plant is drying down. What they would like to do is ideally harvest at the right moisture content and then that could go right into storage. However, if it is immature seed, it's gonna have a higher moisture, or if it's rained or so, so, so that seed moisture is just going up and down with whatever the environment is going on. So if it's a high relative humidity, or if there's wetness, it's gonna be picking up moisture from there. So the ideal thing is that you wanna harvest at the right moisture content and then go into the storage and things like that. I, I only have some things that I've written, but we've not actually characterized that, so I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to speculate on on that right now. But thank you. That's a, that's a that's a good point because again, is generally when when we're in more of the seed, where the seed buyer right now, New York is not a seed producer. We really are relying on what has happened upstream with the seed companies, what they've done with seed processing or what we call seed conditioning, sorting the seeds, doing things like that. Uh, and as I and I, and I just want to add one other point on, on seed size. Again, as we're doing this purity, we look at the seeds. We're also taking. We have the thousand uh, seed weight or thousand kernel weight, they call it. But you do see varietal differences. Some are just larger seed than others. But even within the sample we have, there's a large difference in seed size. There's small seeds, medium seeds, large, large seeds. And again, we want uniformity of germination. We want uniformity of stand establishment. That does not set us on the right foot if we're already starting off with a wide range of seed sciences within the same seed lot. So again, something else, uh, uh, something else we need to kind of look at a little bit there too. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. So just with uh, your other grain and, and uh, crops, you have seed, seed foundation here that checks for quality and, and uh, the inerts and everything else. To me, it looks like the hemp is kind of a rogue introduction to the to the seed industry and I would suspect that importing these seeds from other countries similar to grain you're going to have those imperfections you're going to have those variations so I'm assuming uh, APHIS Ag and Markets uh, Seed Foundation they're going to work at developing uh, some some basic standards for the seed or is this just going to be a open forum on whatever whatever comes in well, uh uh, uh, multiple points that you're making and all really all really good with because the the bottom line is we want to assure a New York grower that's going to be planting the hemp that they have good quality seed uh, I, I think if we look at Canada Canada started this 1998 so they've been doing they've been growing hemp for many years and these seed companies I would say are pretty mature they're not ma and pa type of companies that are just you know, going out here, whacking some seeds off and threshing them out and selling them. Now, these, these are big operations. And when we're buying, you know, a 750 kilogram totes of those that are coming in, that's a big seed production facility that they have. I've not seen it, but it's, they're, they're very mature in that. They also have their own seed certification standards. For, for example, to make that number one certified has to have the high germination of 85 or better, but just a few seeds. Now, if it turns out, let's say, just one other crop seed and then two weed seeds, if that sample they pull has four weed seeds in it, even though the germination is 90%, it drops it down automatically to their certified level number two. The grower doesn't really know that. 
They, they just know it's a, it's a level two certification, it's a lower grade. They don't know why they have, but, but we can track that down and know. So, so I think in, in their system, they're using both the purity as a criteria for high quality and the germination. And it's, real, it's, real, it's, real, it's, a, it's a good system. It's a little different than what we do here in the States, but it is a good system so you know if you're getting that number one certified that you're getting very good seed. Yes, sir. So the numbers you gave us earlier on the rates of germination, those were provided by the um, vendor at their certified levels? Okay, there, there, there's two things. So when I talked about the Anka, the three seed lots of Anka, I, I don't even have the third seed lot yet. Every, everything's pretty, pretty new. And then it's, it's not only 50 miles from, from Ithaca to Geneva, but it's just cumbersome, I'll just put it that way, and get moving seeds around even within the Cornell system. So we have not done any of the testing on these three Anka lots. What I'm saying is we do have samples from all of these types along with four other fiber types. That is where we did the actual germination and we're doing the purity right now. We're, we're that new into this. When we have this field day two weeks from today in Geneva, I'm gonna be able to talk more than I can now just because we're, the, you know, we're generating the data as we speak. So you'll be able to compare that data to what they certify that's, that's ultimately what I wanna be able to do. Yeah, is, is we're taking out of a little baggie a sample compared to them going through their large inventory. So we want to make sure that what we're saying is representative. Not that anybody's right or wrong, it's just being really representative. Yeah. Exactly. Good. Yes? Uh, how do you plan to deal with uh, seed theft? I'm not sure if there's patent laws or things like that surrounding seed. Um, so say somebody took a, a top of headed one of your plants here and took the seed and replanted it, what kind of repercussions would there be? Those are more the legal aspects, and we kind of talked about some of that, but, but basically it's it's not legal. Right. You'd be dealing with trespass in addition to the fact. Yeah, there's, so there's, 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 I'll say, multiple issues around doing something like that. Right, so how is Cornell able to import it? Is it under the context of research? Jamie really did a yeoman's job of, of doing this. Jamie, you want to talk on, on acquiring I, the seeds for Cornell? I think, I think Chris is going to cover all of uh, regulatory stuff. Okay, okay, perfect. So we'll perfect. Let him Let's we'll, <laughs> stay tuned and we'll get that question answered for you. Yes, sir. Yeah, did you do a moisture test on the incoming seed from Canada so you know what least level was there? We have not gathered that data, but what we do have are the samples that are still in the original bag so we can go ahead and sample out of that. What we're really concerned about is when we get a small when you get a 100 gram sample, which is like a cup full of seeds, and that's in an open porous container, and it's a humid day or a dry day, that's all gonna change. So we really need to go back as the best we can to that, and then take a deep core out of that, then we will have a more representative. But yeah, as you know, as every this whole season kind of progressed and getting things, there's a lot of woulda, coulda, shouldas, and there always is in doing research, but this was really a hurry up type of a year to get as far as we are right now. I think next year will be more in place with doing those quality right as soon as we receive the seeds. Uh, excellent point. We need to be really good seedsmen here on our side as well. Okay, yes ma'am. Do you, um, do all of these plants have a THC and CBDC <coughs> profile? Have they been tested yet? And is it available anywhere for us so we can know what THC quantity or what CBD and what types of CBD? Is it CBDA, CBDB, <coughs> just CBD? Do they have, have these varieties been tested for that yet? That's all to be done, correct, Chris? Did you hear the question? Oh, yeah, so the question was, have, have all the varieties been tested, sorry, for THC and CBD levels? Um, and the varieties we're going growing here, we'll test here. Um, but in Canada, there's a, actually a really informative website, um, like Ontario Canada Fact Sheets. And they have fact sheets that cover lots and lots of different things. And one of the things they have is a list of varieties and um, those they found to be low or high THC contents. And, and I can't remember off the top of my head if they have CDB in there as well. Um, but that's a, a very informative site for you. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Really, really good questions. And uh, again, there's a lot of unsolved questions, but we, we are addressing these. So, so thank you very much for your comments and questions. Okay, thank you, Alan. I need that, uh, I need that other microphone on there.
Okay, so so our last uh, speaker is Chris Logue, who um, well, I really appreciate came the long distance. I mean, most of us are right here on campus or with Alan a little over an hour away, but Chris came quite a distance uh, from Albany to be here. Um, Chris is the director of the Division of Planned Industry in the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, and he'll be talking about some of these regulatory issues like the question that was asked, um, as well as potential markets here. So thank you very, very much for the opportunity to be here today. I know I'm going to get lots of questions, so I'm glad I don't have notes that I'm going to follow. Um, I'm just going to start out a little bit and tell you sort of how we got here. Um, Gary described himself as a student of hemp diseases. I have become a student of hemp. It's been the school of hard knocks. There's some people sitting out here that have been very, very helpful to me in learning about this crop. Um, so it's been a couple of years that we've been working on hemp and as all of you know we started out at the department with a pretty conservative uh, program that limited our research partners or limited research uh, permits to folks who were uh, affiliated with colleges and universities and institutions of higher education. Uh, this spring we were able to open it up and, and bring some farmers into it and some other folks. Uh, and then, of course, added a number of research partners with the uh, ANCA trial this summer. Um, so we're definitely sort of on the track towards a, a more liberal approach to this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the authority for any of us to be doing this. So the authority for any of us to be engaged in this uh, comes from the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, and basically what the 2014 Farm Bill did, and I'll just paraphrase, uh, basically it enabled uh, universities or institutions of higher education and state departments of agriculture to engage in industrial hemp research pilot programs. So on the good side, the Farm Bill doesn't define what a pilot research program is. And it doesn't necessarily define what commercialization is. That, in a way, is sort of a double-edged sword. It's a good thing. It's not defined. It lets us sort of figure out what the boundaries are. But I think the other thing that you need to keep in mind, if this is something that you're considering doing, that at some point along the way, somebody might say, hey, you're up against the fence. You're going too far, OK? And uh, we are dealing quite a bit with uh, Department of Justice and DEA. And um, I have to tell you, they've been extremely helpful to us. I think they've been pretty responsive with Cornell and SUNY Morrisville. But this is out of the ordinary for them. They regulate controlled substances from cradle to grave. In the case of hemp, they regulate the seed and then they step away from it. So this is new territory for them as well. The other piece that I'll throw out there uh, is that the farm bill will be uh, up for renewal or renegotiation in 2018. And so uh, we need to be aware that, you know, there could potentially be some changes in that language in the Farm Bill. And so that's one of the things that's on my tick list from a policy perspective, uh, working with some of our policy folks in Albany and in Washington, D.C., to make sure that we can continue to move forward. So. Uh, going forward with the 2018 Farm Bill, you could see the same language that was in 2014. You could see a step back away from that that maybe restricts us more. Or you could see from a federal level maybe some liberalization. Um, so we need to be aware of that from the policy perspective. The other thing I'll say on the federal side is, is that, you know, we had some very high level discussions with uh, some of the federal folks. And again, they are... Uh, Frankly, they don't answer a lot of questions directly. So if you start asking me questions about federal policy, I'm probably going to be a little cagey too. Um, there is also, if you go on our website, you know, you can you can check out a number of documents that are very very important from a from a regulatory and an authority perspective. Uh, the three things that I would say you want to be looking at and be aware of on the federal level are the wording of the 2014 Farm Bill. Uh, the wording in the 2016 Omnibus Budget Act that's very important as well. Uh, and then the third piece is, is a guidance document from, I think, July or August of last year that came out from DEA, FDA, and USDA. So those are sort of the three guiding documents that are out there. There's still a whole lot of gray in this. 
what we've tried to do as we've moved forward with this uh, is to build a program that is, if you will, a safe harbor for folks who want to get involved in this. We want to try to keep you uh, as farmers, growers, processors, what have you, uh, sort of in a safe place from the federal perspective, but at the same time trying to move this ahead and learn as much as we possibly can. Um, one thing I do want to uh, actually make sure everybody knows Kate in the back there. Kate is the person who, if you call our office and you call the Hemp 800 number that was announced a few weeks ago, you will most likely talk with Kate. Uh, and she will, if she can't answer your question, she's going to take down your information and, and get, it, get the question to somebody who can help you. Um, so bear with us on that. We're sort of building this as we go. I want to make a, just a quick comment on the trial behind me here. Um, this is probably the best hemp I've seen. Not that I've seen a lot. But I was in Kentucky a couple of weeks ago for the Hemp Regulatory Conference. And we were on several farms. And basically, we were hearing all the same things that all the Cornell faculty have said today. Uh, seed quality, uh, emergence, competition with weeds, the lack of herbicides. If you're, if you're in a situation where you would use an herbicide or another crop protectant on this, we're, we're coming up against all the same issues that have been, been identified in other states. Uh, so we're learning a lot as we go along. So a little bit about the process going forward. Um, I've, from, a, from an administrative perspective, I've kind of felt for the last two and a half years like I've been a little bit behind the curve on the timing on this. Um, and so we're always, trying, we're always on a scramble to get things done. And so our goal going forward this year is, uh, for 2018 I should say, is to try to roll out um, the application process very, very soon. And so I'm going to throw some dates out there. Please don't come call me if this doesn't come true and give me a hard time. I'd like it to open up uh, for applications during the month of August. That's this month, probably towards the end of the month because we've got some uh, vacations and some other professional meetings that we, our staff, are engaged in. Um, and what that would do is Basically, we'd probably leave that application period open for uh, several months, maybe into the middle or end of October. That's going to give folks adequate time to develop their research plan. And again, I keep circling back around to that farm bill. That allows us to do research, not commercialization. So the thing that I'm going to weigh most heavily on an application is what's your research plan? What are you going to be able to bring to the table to offer uh, as far as new knowledge or knowledge gained. And that, again, we take a very, very broad approach to research. It can be agronomic, it can be uh, pest management, it can be marketing, it can be product development, you name it. You can probably make the argument that it's research. Um, so basically getting that out there August, September, October of this year is going to give you folks uh, time to develop a good plan. It's going to give you time to start talking with your seed suppliers in Canada, the European Union, wherever you uh, decide you're going to get your seed from. And it also gives us a little bit more time. We actually applied for our DEA import permit on March 17th of this year. And uh, the DEA came out, I think, on June 27th or something, and they interviewed several of us. They took all of our personal information, names of our eldest children, where they were located, all that kind of good stuff. And um, so we're waiting on our permit. So next year, hopefully that permit will be in place soon. I'd like it to be in place before we go out with our application for 2018. I don't know if that's realistic or not. So once that permit is in place, that's going to give us the opportunity at the department to play the role of the importer. So what that means is if you were a uh, research partner with the department in 2018, you would figure out what seed variety you wanted or varieties you wanted. You would talk with the seed company, Canada, the European Union, wherever and uh, make all the arrangements, financial, shipping, what have you, to get the seed into the country. 
Uh, and when it's imported, it would be delivered to Albany. And at that point, you would come to Albany and pick it up. We would release it to you. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at going forward. So we're hoping for a much more streamlined process. Um, definitely invested in this. Want to be uh, as helpful as we can to folks. Um, a couple things from the processing perspective. That was the other thing um, that I was asked to talk about today. So two things I think I want to sort of talk a little bit about sort of what I think of what's going on in the industry. I kind of look at the two major issues that I think are facing us, almost like, almost like a set of bookends. You got the seed issue, okay, and we've talked about a lot of the physical attributes of the seed um, as far as seed quality, emergence, all that type of thing. You have the political or the regulatory aspects of it. Where can you get it? It's hard to get into the country, okay? Need a lot of permits. So if this industry is going to move forward, I think the plant breeding program and getting a domestic seed supply, and when I say domestic seed supply, I mean the seed supply within the borders of New York State where this product is under the state's authority, is really, really important. I'm not a plant breeder, but I do have a background in horticulture. I think we all have to realize that's not going to happen overnight, okay? Um, I've had a bunch of questions here, and I heard some questions here today about uh, feral stands of uh, hemp. And so that's definitely something that's sort of on our radar screen. We got to understand what that what that is. So that feral hemp that's out there, that could be um, that could be something else. We don't know. Probably hasn't been tested for THC. Number one. Uh, number two, uh, we need to understand what the genetics of it are. So it could be the foundation for a really good breeding program, or it might be something that we don't want. Okay, and so it's going to take some time to understand what that is. Okay. Um, the other bookend that I think is really, really important uh, is the processing and the marketing. Okay, so that's the other thing that is potentially a little bit risky and where we need to do a lot more work and have a better understanding of uh, what, this, what this plant and what this industry can do. And, uh, you know, there's some of you here that have known me for a while. I was in extension for over 20 years and actually this isn't very much different than any other crop. I talked with a hemp farmer the other day and I said, hey, I'm going to tell you the exact same thing. I talked to people 20 years about strawberries, greenhouse flowers, whatever. We can teach you how to grow this, but we can't necessarily teach you how to sell it, how to market it. That part of it, you guys have to really sort of take the ball and, and run with that to a certain extent. So what we're working on as far as marketing is concerned is, is we have in our uh, division of ag development, we have some staff who uh, do work on marketing efforts and we're uh, at least taking the step of moving forward, identifying processors within the state of New York. Because again, relatively easy. If you've got some hemp product, you can, in relative, with relative ease, move it about within the borders of the state. Uh, we're also identifying processors outside the state of New York. And so at least we'll have a resource list available to you that folks can look at. Um, and then the other thing is, I believe yesterday or the day before, Empire State Development came out with some processor grants. So there are some funds available uh, to help to spur the processing industry. And so if you call us at the department and talk with Kate, I'm pretty sure you do have a, uh, you've got a contact person at ESD now, so we have someone we can, we can refer you to. Um, seed. Seed. Certification. Yes, thank you. Um, the other thing that's on our tick list coming out of uh, the bill signing and the summit and really related to my, my comments about developing a domestic within the borders of New York seed industry, uh, one of the things that we really have high on our list to do is to develop some seed certification standards. So we've got, if you look in uh, the Ag and Markets Law, there are seed certification standards for all kinds of different crops that we grow. We work closely with the folks here um, at New York uh, State Seed Improvement and Cornell when we develop those standards. 
But that's going to be very, very important. And really what it comes down to, as Dr. Taylor said, in a nutshell, is sort of consumer protection for the people who are buying that seed. Okay? Uh, and that's really going to uh, set, the, set the stage for developing that industry along with development of, of some genetics that are uh, good for New York as well as good for the various uses of industrial hemp. With that, I can answer some questions. I'm sure there will be some. There always are. Yes, sir. Uh, with respect to the 2018 Farm Bill, what are the political pressure points that can be used to make sure it's motivated in a favorable direction? So the, the question was, uh, in regards to the 2018 Farm Bill, what are the pressure points as far as a uh, favorable outcome? You know, I think one of the things with anything at a federal level, and, and again, hemp is a very small piece of, well, actually not. It's a very large piece of what I've been doing over the last couple of years, but we've got a lot of other issues where we're dealing with the federal government, and I would just say in general, there's a lot of um, anxiety among sort of middle management folks in, uh, in federal agencies. Um, not necessarily a great deal of of direction. I would say one thing that we may have from a favorable perspective is Kentucky is a big state in hemp and so you have Mitch McConnell with a leadership position uh, in, in Congress and so that potentially um, you know helps with the whole uh, hemp situation but I think you know try, trying to predict what the pressure points are is is pretty hard with how things have been have been working at the federal level at this point. <laughs> so the, the question is, is it on the New York delegation? And I think there's been a, quite a bit of interest from, uh, from the New York delegation from my perspective. Donna, do you have something you want to add to that? Uh, we were just with Senator Gillibrand recently, and she's one of the main sponsors of the 2018 Industrial Hemp Farming Act. So our hope is that um, because of the interest from largely from Kentucky, Rand Paul and Mitch McConnell and others, and the widespread support in places across the country where it's growing, that we can get around those pressure points by just pressuring for full passage of, of legalization. And we think that... Um, is uh, looking um, much more likely than it's ever before. Uh, I'm not positive how many of our New York congressmen have signed on. Last year, I think we had five. Um, and uh, our congressman uh, had re has recently retired, so he's not on the bill at the moment. Uh, but yeah, that's our goal. The goal is to pass the Industrial Hemp Farming Act and just make everybody's lives a lot easier. I'll stick around in case okay. you Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question regarding the farm bill. Do you know why there, there's so much effort by the DEA and play on words when it comes to the CBD extract part of the plant? If they try to make it like it's THC, we know it's not THC. They play around with a lot of words. And I've read. Are you talking about the rescheduling? No. The not just the rescheduling. Well, yes, rescheduling, but also as part of the Farm Act. They're trying to delineate the CBD, and it doesn't sound favorable right now. So a, a couple things is, is, is there are even some states, and as I said, I was in Kentucky two weeks ago for the regulatory conference, which basically was pretty much limited to folks from state departments of agriculture. There were a few extension people there as presenters as well. So it was a pretty open uh, exchange and forum. And even some of the states have defined industrial hemp as grain and fiber only and have limited CBD research. Um, at the federal level, I think there's again um, a little bit of a, of a disconnect perhaps, if you will, um, because some of those products have not necessarily had clinical trials on them and so there's a hesitancy to move forward with them. Um, and again, I kind of would go back, uh, and I'm not going to, you know, poke another agency, um, 
DEA has been pretty helpful to us. DEA has been pretty helpful, I think, to Cornell and Morrisville. I think, going back to my previous statement, regulatory officials <coughs> look for black and white. And there's not a lot of black and white in this. And so when you have a DEA investigator or someone in a leadership position at DEA, and it doesn't fit neatly into how they've defined other substances, they really struggle with that. And so I think it's sort of a dis uh, discovery or a process of trying to figure out you know, what's what. We've taken a little bit more liberal approach on the CBD end of things, but we've also had a lot of discussions with our State Department of Health over the past six months about CBD. And you know, they're in a role where they're gonna be backing us up on a technical perspective, because as I say to my boss, do you want an entomologist, a forester, and somebody with a dairy science background to be evaluating projects that might have medical or health implications? It's out of my wheelhouse. If you start to talk to me about the agronomy or the pest management, I can probably look at that pretty easily and tell if it's a good project, a worthy project. If I have questions, I have probably 11, right, folks at Cornell who can help me out with that. You start getting into some of the CBD stuff and start to make health claims and that type of thing, and even to some extent nutritional claims, we don't necessarily have the backstop for that right now. And so we're developing that. How about you? Hey, how's it going, Chris? Good. Based on that line um, of what we're just talking about now, what is New York State's definition then of medical CBD marijuana versus what I'm looking at right now, which is okay. hemp with CBD oil in it. Right. What's the, what's the difference there? Is it a gray area? So thank you for saying it's a gray area because it is a gray area. We're trying to figure that out. You know, and one of the things that's uh, a little bit of a challenge is, is so within the medical marijuana program, there are very strict quality control standards in there, very strict production standards. That's not stuff that we have in the industrial hemp, current industrial hemp regulations. It's not something that, frankly, is in the next iteration of the industrial hemp regulations. Um, but we're working on trying to define where those regulatory boundaries are and, and when other agencies have to be brought in. So we, you know, we don't want to get in trouble, and we don't want anybody that's sit sitting here in the audience to get in difficulty with either another state agency or a federal agency. And so I think a little bit of patience, a little bit of working through it, and we'll certainly get there. Chris, yep. I have a little experience in hemp and marijuana and medical marijuana. As a police officer, <coughs> I might not be confused by some of these taller varieties, but I definitely would be confused with the smaller varieties, not just based on its look, but based on its smell, its texture, and that essentially there's not real, there's that gray area. Um, so is egg and markets when people are applying for these applications, helping them reach out to their local police to make sure that they're aware. I know we have a sign, but my neighbors would probably read that sign and just report me for growing sure. marijuana. So, so the question was, what about you know uh, working with law enforcement as far as on industrial hemp? And so, uh, I don't have the regulations in front of me, but basically, what we currently have in the regulations and um, definitely is going into the next version is a requirement for when you get your industrial hemp research authorization from the department, you have a certain amount of time to reach out to your local law enforcement agency and let them know that you have this permit, okay? And so each of the original uh, 10 authorization holders have done that, um, and they report back to us that they've completed it. Uh, oftentimes they send us a copy of the letter or give a reference to a phone call or what have you that happened. And interestingly enough, we've gotten questions on it. We had somebody actually call in, um, and it came, I don't think it came to my desk, I think it came to Tim's desk, and uh, came to his desk as, you have an industrial hemp call. Well, it was a county sheriff, and a fisherman had scampered up from the riverbank, and apparently had walked some distance from where he 
started fishing and he came up in something that looked like this and he called the called the police and um, so you know that particular uh, authorization holder had talked with somebody within the county sheriff's department but it, some of the word hadn't gone through the whole organization so we were able to take that call and answer it we also have had calls from New York State Police uh, Intelligence Unit because some of our authorization holders have sent the license in um, the license looks like our plant life plant industry uh, plant dealer or plant grower license and um, when you photocopy it the security paper the watermark doesn't show up and so they rightfully questioned whether it was a re the real deal or not did you want to add something Donna two things uh, just for um, for reference in uh, Binghamton University has 15,000 uh, CBD rich plants in the ground in a raised bed format they're doing a different type of grow uh, their plants were imported as cuttings from Kentucky it's IP, that is IP protected material that's been cut, it, cut and cloned. And the local sheriff was very uh, interested to come and see what was going on. But we've had across the board support from law enforcement, largely because when they understand the issue of cross pollination, this does uh, have an impact on illegally grown marijuana, which makes them very happy. Some of us not so much, but some, some people mm -hmm. are not happy about it. Yes. Okay. So, and, and since Donna brought up Kentucky, I guess I should address that issue. So if you look at the program, or the if you look at the U.S. Department of Justice guidance and you look at the uh, USDA, the, the three agency guidance document from a year ago, it expressly forbids the movement of plants and seeds among states. However, there's another document that says industrial hemp can move among states that have um, programs, state authorized programs. And so the guidance document doesn't necessarily have force of, of law behind it. I will tell you that the DEA is fully aware that plants and seeds are coming from Kentucky and Colorado and Oregon. Um, the department's not going to facilitate that. Um, but we are not, at this point, going to forbid you from doing that. I think that will probably continue to be a question that we wrestle with a little bit. Um, you know, some of the other states in, uh, that we interfaced with down in Kentucky, um, basically were saying, well, once you do that, you don't kind of know what you're getting into your state. And so potentially you have some issues going forward um, from a regulatory perspective. So if you do that, you're doing it at your own risk, and anybody who's a current authorization holder has read all of the releases and signed the forms, anybody that applies, you'll, you'll see the paperwork that's involved in this. Sir. One of my wife's Canadian relatives involved in the hemp industry up there. He said a nightly occurrence Car pulls up, jumps the fence, whack a few bushes, back in the car, and away they go. As a grower or possessor of hemp in New York through this program, what are my legal responsibilities should that happen on my farm? Go back to bed, call the cops. This is getting out into the community, even whatever, sure. whatever it's in it. So, first off, I'm not an attorney. I'm a plant industry director. But what I would say is, is if I, if I held a... If I held a research authorization and that was happening, I would first, <coughs> per our regulation, you've already got a relationship with your local law enforcement. That's part of the reason we want you to call if you have our research authorization. That's part of the reason we want you to call local law enforcement so they know it's there, so they maybe can drive by a little more often if they want to keep an eye on what's going on, but also so you have a relationship. So I would say, you want to you want to call them and report it, um, and the other piece of it is is for whoever's taking it. They have no legal protection. Once they cross the fence, okay. If I cut one of these now and I went outside across that fence, I have a controlled substance, and so any law enforcement officer, because I'm not a research authorization holder in the program, would have every right to stop me. 
So I would say you report it and document that as well. Because one of the things that, you know, potentially happens going forward is, is you potentially get into a situation where your neighbor maybe doesn't like this kind, this form of agriculture and decides they want to challenge you on that. Exactly. So you want to have uh, a good, you know, good record that you have been diligent about controlling this product and keeping it uh, from getting where it shouldn't be. Yes, sir. Kind of a compound question for you here, Chris, flowing from this one. Um, how do you establish the, the chain of title or provenance of the product that you have if you do acquire it um, by appropriate means and you're a processor, et cetera? Do you need to have a certification or you know, the bill of sale? What documentation will um, essentially qualify you to hold that product? And then you had mentioned earlier um, that it's fairly easy to move this product around within the state of New York. That suggests to me that it might be a little bit, but you also did say identifying processors out of state. Right. So I'm, I'm curious, is it, uh, is it something where the raw product, the raw seed, et cetera, is more difficult to send out of state? If once it's processed into a product, is that relatively easier to send out? Sure. So uh, a couple things. So number one, uh, your first question was sort of how do, you, how do you establish the chain of title, correct? And so what we've done up to now is, is that we have had our authorization holders, if they're sending a product to processing, we've added that processor as a site under their existing license. I think what we're going to do going forward um, is to actually register processors. And so we don't envision the registration of processors to have a fee attached to it at this point in time. It's basically you're filing with us to say you are a hemp processor. That way, if you are in possession, um, and really what concerns us um, is if you were a processor and you're in possession of any propagative material. So in other words, seed that hasn't been roasted or denatured or sterilized. Um, we want to have uh, you as a processor have a piece of paper in your hand that says you're authorized to have that in the event that federal officials came in and you know, asked why you had that product. Um, the second part of your question? Was again about uh, the ease of transporting product across state lines, okay. raw product versus So product. if you go back, you, and again, I don't have the exact wording in my mind, but if you go back to the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, it actually exempts certain parts of the plant, even right within the Controlled Substances Act. Now, one of the things I will say, and again, I'm not in the business of poking uh, another agency, especially the DEA, since I need to get a permit from them right now, they don't have not if you, in, if you interpret the Controlled Substances Act uh, literally, you could make the interpretation that hemp was never illegal. It was just really hard to get the permits for it. In fact, nobody ever got the permits for it over the past 50 years. Um, so seed and plants, probably pretty difficult to get from uh, state to state that's going to pique the interest of the DEA. And I will tell you in, in our interviews, they're well aware of what's going on and have what I would say is pretty good intelligence. Um, the other parts of the plant should move very easily among states that have an industrial hemp program. North Dakota, I believe, last year ran into some problems where one of their authorization holders had a large amount of material, and I don't, can't remember what part of the plant it was, that DEA uh, held for a period of time. And the Department of Agriculture and the DEA you know, got into a, into a uh, war of letters, and eventually the product was released and went to where it needed to go. So I think we're going to run into some bumps like that from time to time. And again, what happened last year, which was, I believe, in, was either in December or January, uh, in talking sort of informally with my counterpart in North Dakota, his take on it was there was an administration change going on, there was a lack of clarity as to where this was going, and that somebody at a regional level had decided to take advantage of that change and try to make an example, so to speak. 
So I think, you know, I think as we move through the 2018 Farm Bill process, we're going to have a much better sense of what the federal administration is thinking and where we're going on this. Yes, ma'am. So if you if you're planting hemp on forested land, it's like I've had theft on forested property, and this was handled by the I guess the forestry department of the state police. So if you're planting hemp on a property that's forested, well, let's say part of it is forested and you're planting mm -hmm. on, um, who do you go to if you have a I think if you have a theft issue and you're holding our, you know, if you're holding our Ag and Markets Research Authorization, you would go to your local law enforcement officials, but you would also want to be sure that we at the department knew what was going on as well. And do you get signage to put on the property? So the current regulation, and again, the current regulation that's on the books, we wrote those uh, with the research institutions in mind. So frankly, they're a little bit outdated for where we are right now as far as what's going on in the state. Those original regulations did have a specific signage requirement. And going forward, that's not going to be in the next iteration of the regulations because you sort of have a double-edged sword with signage. It can, if you put a no trespassing sign here, I'm not going to go in. but. If my wife saw a no trespassing sign here, she would go in because she'd want to see what was in there. Um, we tested that years ago at the Washington State Governor's Mansion, and the troopers took us out of there. So, you know, we, we got like three steps up the driveway. It's not like in Albany where there's a gate. Anyway, um, so, you know, signage is really going to depend upon your, your situation. Um, you know, driving up and looking at this from the road. I could tell it was hemp from the road, but I was looking for hemp. If I was driving by here and had no idea that it was here, I would just think it was some different field crop. So a lot's going to depend upon, upon your location. The signage, to a certain extent, you know, one of our authorization holders said, hey, we're, you're putting an advertisement on this. And he wasn't concerned about the local kids going in the field and stealing it. He was concerned about uh, you know, somebody else within a five mile radius that was perhaps growing something else and didn't want the pollen from his crop to contaminate an illicit grow and having it be destroyed because of that. Yes? Um, is there any answer as to whether uh, a farmer who's holding a federal program benefit like through FSA can grow under the New York permits? Excellent question. So the question was, uh, can somebody who is participating in some of the federal, some of the other federal programs like Conservation Reserve or what have you, can they uh, hold our permit and participate without putting into jeopardy their other payments? And so we've been going back and forth quite a bit with our legal counsel on that, and we don't necessarily have a have a clear answer on that. Our legal counsel at the department feels as though um, with our research authorization there shouldn't be a problem but that is not to say that somebody at the county level in an FSA or another federal office couldn't hold something up. So I think that's something we're still working on and trying to hammer that out and perhaps um, you know, perhaps that's something from a policy perspective that needs to be defined better in the farm bill. I do think the bill that was signed here back a few weeks ago the, at the state level um, reiterates the fact that this is an agricultural commodity, and I think that may help a little bit with this, but we're sort of on untested waters on that. But it's a great question and one that we've heard a number of times and are working on. So thank you. Yes, sir. Chris, uh, you mentioned we've got, what, 31 states now that are involved in research and hemp production of some sort. Is there any uh, uh, group lobbying effort uh, out of, you know, going on a federal level to look at legislation for the 2018 Farm Bill? I mean, our current attorney general is probably not hemp, hemp uh, 
<laughs> friendly or sure. I, I think you mentioned one other workshop that he spells everything P-O-T. So, uh, <laughs> but but I mean moving forward, I mean as as uh, as these states develop this this federal, uh, I thought that was going to be one of the book the bookends you were talking about sure. is is a federal. Yeah, I mean that one is that one is for sure is is also in there. Um, so you know, I've been asked actually was asked yesterday to be sure to write up, you know, my policy issues within plant industry for uh, the 2018 farm bill and and uh, you know was encouraged to have several that related to industrial hemp. So I think we'll come at it from that direction. I also think that the uh, National Association of State Departments of Agriculture uh, will will likely, and that's basically the commissioners and the state directors and, and uh, those types of folks at the highest levels, um, will probably have something from a policy perspective. Um, and then, you know, there's the Hemp Industries Association and some of the other, like Vote Hemp, who I think will have some, some pressure from you know the producer and the general public Farm side, Bureau. New York Farm and Farm Bureau. Bureau probably will as well. I don't know. Is that in their policy manual at this yes, policy it is. book? Yes, I got it put in there. All right. We got that ten limit put in there too. We lobby in Albany and in um, Washington, and I make sure that I go because some of the older people still don't understand the difference between marijuana and hemp, and still legislators like when you said there were about five um, when Donna was saying that like there really weren't when I brought it up people were not in the last three years understanding it now it's like they're like oh yeah I've heard about this and we're gonna keep going and if you want to contact your county Farm Bureau and help support them and let them know that people are farmers are interested in it. if they don't know farmers are interested in it they're not gonna want it you know we Farm Bureau supports what farmers want and if they're not feeling a need from farmers, then they're not going to want to support it. You know that I'm just the crazy hemp lady. So, no, not at all. Because I had a question. We yes. heard a lot about seed protection and cloning protection, but what about it's a perennial plant? Mm -hmm. So how are we protecting it from growing back perennially? Like if a farmer cuts it down, say with a scythe and leaves the roots in the ground, there's a good chance it's gonna come back on its own. Or if they let it go to seed and they don't collect all those seeds before they hit the ground, there's a good chance it's just gonna seed itself. So how how are we talking about protection on that? And like with apples or other farm commodities, is there like a statue of limitations, like an apple that is crossbred, they have a new Snapdragon one, I can plant it, but I can't sell it for 10 years and then I will be able to sell it as whatever. Are there, are there things like that for this so perennial growth and so I don't think we've really addressed that at this point in time and perhaps that's something you know I know that's an issue because what I've learned is when it goes through the combine it does shatter and so you do have a lot of uh, reseeding during just during the harvesting process so that is probably something that we've got to address at some point going forward yep Yes. Is there any uh, um, interest in, in developing a market for the herd and putting that back in the ground and getting carbon credits? I know there's a lot of activity in India and in uh, Europe. Uh, there's a whole market. So we actually have an authorization holder or current authorization holder that has a piece of that in their research plan to be looking at that a little bit. And I think um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Vians was talking a little bit about the systematics person looking at how it fits into a rotation. Um, and so there may be some, you know, really good agronomic and, and carbon uh, credit issues, uh, you know, that are benefits in a rotation, even if you weren't going to the extent of growing it for grain or some other purpose. Is there, is there going to be a cap on how many research license holders? Um, are going to be available for next year? So the cap yeah. was removed from the law. Okay. So what I would say to you is, um, you know, we're still going to require an application. We're still going to require the application fee. It's $500 for three years. And we're still going to, as long as the farm bill's in place and says it's a research pilot program, we're still going to be evaluating proposals. Um, and you know, making sure that, that the projects that we uh, that we uh, give the authorizations to, you know, have a research outcome associated with them. But we don't anticipate a limited number. Now, you know, the other piece of it, I also need to be pre 
protective of the fact that there are many important missions that my division is responsible for in New York State. And I have a limited number of people out there to do this work. Um, and so we have export certification and interstate certification of, of many agricultural products that are very uh, lucrative for the state of New York, for our farmers, and we need to make sure we fulfill that. Uh, we have uh, plant pest and survey responsibilities for invasive uh, insects and diseases that would uh, you know, cause damage to the agriculture of New York as well as the environment. We have to take that very, very seriously. So I guess where I'm going is, is if I got 10,000 applications, I probably can't award or, uh, give out 10,000 authorizations. But what we're hoping to do is create an environment where we're learning as much as we can going forward for the time when maybe the Industrial Hemp Farming Act sails through. And if it's no longer a regulated substance, then our role is diminished a great deal, I would say, from a regulatory perspective. The other part that I'll just throw out there is, is I think anybody who's involved in this, for the time being, with it being federally regulated as well as regulated at the state level, um, you have to understand what it is that you're growing. You need to know your seed source. You need to know that it does meet the 0.3% THC. Um, and you need to do everything you know in your power to protect yourself as well as protect um, all the great work that's been done to bring this from something that everybody was scared to death of two years ago to something where there's you know 50 or 100 people under a tent at Ithaca talking about it. So Donnie, you want to make a comment on that? I know we're running long, but I just want to make a couple of quick summary comments. First, I want to thank Cornell for putting this together. This is really informative. Um, I just wanted you to know that you should feel really good about being in New York State right now around this. Uh, compared to other states who may be permitting this, I mean, all of the gears are in motion. Uh, as hard as it is to believe, I have to pinch myself. The governor just put $10 million down on the table for uh, processor grants of $250,000. And we have a one-stop shop and a, a helpline and, and many, many folks, good folks like Chris Lewis and others uh, in Aga Markets who are very committed to this. What I'm hoping to see happen, that's what, what I wanted to leave you with and from my end, is we're hoping that hubs will be developing. We're seeing a food and beverage hub starting to develop in central New York. We're seeing a CBD pharmaceutical <coughs> hub starting to develop in the southern tier. Hudson Valley is also doing some food and beverage and, and some other, and some CBD. But it would be helpful if the Farm Bureau and Farm Collectives could get more organized so that we're not sort of tripping over each other. That you've got 10 farms all growing the same thing with a partner farmer, I mean a partner processor with a market in mind. So we're not sort of in the wild west here. Um, the governor has been, um, directed all of them, Park State Development, and all the regional economic development councils to prioritize this. So in central New York, Finger Lakes, and southern tier, where there's a lot of money from the Upstate Revitalization Initiative, they're looking for projects. And they want to be able to provide some funding to, to help this. So we're lucky in this regard. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for going along with this crazy idea. Uh, Chris, I have a question. Yes. Do you uh, make a list of the farmers available to people who want to process so that we know where to go get material? So we have not done that at this point in time. And so we're working through some, uh, some uh, foil issues on that and just trying to understand exactly what we can and can't release. And so we probably will have the answers to those questions in the next couple of weeks because we've been asked. But there's, I mean, if, if processors are really interested, Extension puts out newsletters to all farmers, put in ad newsletters that you're looking for <coughs> feed or you're looking for fiber, what you're looking for, and they'll come to you. Right. And then no foil needed. Right. Okay. right. So if you were to get a farmer to give you seed, it has to be sterilized at the farmer level, or are you allowed to sterilize it? So as a processor. As a processor, you could sterilize it. But the other thing is is that, from what I've been told by some of the uh, authorization holders, is one of the things that they want is to be able to use the unsterilized seed in some, in some products, and that there are some attributes of the seed you know, before it's roasted or before it's denatured in some other way that are beneficial. And so 
Uh, what I would say, as long as it's not moving beyond the borders of the state, where we can't really have any real impact on, you know, changing that policy today, um, you know, work with work with us to figure out how to get it to where it needs to go. Yes, sir. Just to clarify, while we navigate the gray area, um, can you get an application to grow for CBD only in New York State right now? Submit one. Okay, and as far as the processes go, are extractions part of that dialogue? Absolutely. So what what's going to happen um, on CBD? A little bit more detail on that. I guess I, I glossed over it a little bit. So a little bit more detail on that is, is that the Department of Health has asked us to put several CBD-related questions on the application so that we can flag projects that need to have somebody with a health, nutritional, or medical background help us to review. And so um, those are probably going to go into a separate pile, and we will have a group of folks from our department as well as from Department of Health who will be looking at those and trying to navigate those through the system and understand exactly what it is that you're wanting to do. And what we're contemplating, and again, this is early on and it's an important detail that you ask about, um, we'll probably, we have a, what's called a research partner agreement. So the way the process works right now is, is you submit an application, uh, we act upon it, we say we like your project. And then the next step is we send you our research partner agreement, which is basically outlining what your responsibilities as our research partner at the, with the State Department of Agriculture, what your responsibilities are, what our responsibilities are. And so in that agreement, on the CBD end of things, there probably will be some specific clauses that are inserted in there um, that are, again, trying to build you a safe harbor within what we currently know about CBD. And it's, every state is struggling with the CBD thing because there's a lack of clarity. I can tell you one more thing that, that out in Oregon we struggle with. In Oregon we had uh, 1,000 acres planted last year and they have 3,000 acres planted this year. Much of it's for CBD. Mm -hmm. There is not enough of uh, infrastructure to do anything with this material. There's so limit, limited on extracting <coughs> facilities, food grade approved facilities, you get all this flour, and it's going out of state right. to get extracted because it has to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's definitely some challenges with that. You know, we were in a processing plant in Kentucky. You know, one part of it was for for food grade work. The other part was was fiber and you know structural materials, and uh, you know, I think they said that's one of the biggest plants in the country, and it wasn't very big, so. You know, that's, as I said, you know, the bookends, the seed, and the processing. The processing piece is vitally important going forward. Dave. It, um, several people have mentioned grower co-ops and collectives and things like that. And Cornell does have a, a resource in Bobby Severson and the Dyson School that provides guidance in terms of uh, co-op co formation. So there is that resource if you would like to pursue it. Thank you. That's very helpful. So, Chris, maybe we should wrap up and yep. let folks talk to everyone individually and walk around the plaza a bit. Sounds great. Thank you. I'm going to get some water. Yeah.